Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans proudly supports the Fight Society podcast. When it comes to the big decision of choosing a mortgage lender, it's important to work with someone you can trust who has your best interests in mind. And with Rocket Mortgage, you'll get a transparent online process that gives you the confidence to make an informed decision. Don't waste time searching through stacks of paperwork. With Rocket Mortgage, you can securely share your financial info to get a mortgage approval in minutes. You can even adjust the rate and length of your loan in real time to make sure you get the mortgage solution that's right for you. Whether you're looking to buy a home or refinance your existing mortgage, you can lift the burden of getting a home loan with Rocket Mortgage. So skip the bank, skip the waiting, and go completely online at quickenloans.com slash MMA. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org number 3030. Fight Society Podcast. I'm your host, Damon Martin. After a week talking a lot of pro wrestling with our good friend Paul Heyman, I want to say a big thank you to him, uh, of course, for doing the show last week, and thanks to everyone from both the mixed martial arts and the pro wrestling world that had a chance to listen to that podcast. It was a lot of fun. I'm sure we will talk to Paul again in the very near future, and of course, congrats to Paul and Brock Lesnar for a big win at WrestleMania last night. I was watching WrestleMania along with uh, seemingly the rest of the world. Good show. Not to delve too much back into pro wrestling, good show, but I will say there were some issues. I thought uh, the Hardy Boys coming back was amazing. That was my favorite part of the show by a long mile. Uh, Roman Reigns beating The Undertaker was not one of my better highlights. I, I think I've made it no, uh, you know, no, no doubt I'm not a big Roman Reigns guy, but to each their own, I, I think there could have been a better way to, uh, to see The Undertaker go out if he was going to lose. I think, uh, I think there were some other options available besides Roman Reigns. But I think if you're a professional wrestling fan, you probably know at this point that Vince McMahon has almost an unhealthy obsession with Roman Reigns. And uh, that's the guy who they wanted to put over. So that's the guy who beat The Undertaker in his uh, retirement match. So anyway, sorry. Don't want to delve too deeply into pro wrestling. I know lose like half the audience when I start talking pro wrestling. But... With that said, we're actually going to end up doing two shows this week. I'm going to drop one now, of course, this one. And then we're going to drop another one later this week with more guests. Today, we're going to get into UFC 210 with a, a conversation with co-main event fighter Gegard Mousasi. We're going to talk to him. We're also going to talk to uh, returning UFC welterweight Ill Will Brooks. And then we're also going to talk to one of the top prospects in the entire sport right now, a, uh, a young lady by the name of Mackenzie Dern, who is uh, one of the hottest prospects in the women's strawweight division. She's fighting out of legacy right now. And uh, as I'm sure you saw the story a couple weeks ago, Dana White said she's already on the UFC radar with good reason. One of the top jiu-jitsu stylists in the world. And now she's a couple fights into her professional career uh, in fighting. So we're going to talk to Mackenzie Dern today as well. Then later this week, we're going to have a show with UFC light heavyweight champion Daniel Cormier. Patrick Cote, who fights the UFC 210 against Thiago Alves, and of course, also UFC Hall of Famer and good friend of the show, Boss Root. So two shows this week. I'll be out of town next week. We will not be doing a show. Uh, there will be a reason for that, and hopefully I will be able to uh, present a very special podcast when I return from a project I'm going to be doing. I can't tease it too much, but I will say I'll be out of town for another week after I get back from Buffalo. be doing something very, very cool uh, with somebody uh, that's got a fight coming up. I don't want to tease it too much until it actually happens, but uh, let's just say this project I'm working on should be pretty awesome, and hopefully it will uh, eventually result in a uh, pretty cool podcast or at least a pretty cool interview as well. So stay tuned for that. But uh, today, of course, as we gear up for UFC 210 this weekend, you know, this card is definitely slipping under the radar. It doesn't have as much star power as UFC 211. There's no doubt about that. But Daniel Cormier, Anthony Rumble Johnson, that is a great fight. Gegard Mousasi against uh, Chris Weidman, that is a great fight. I like the Will Brooks, uh, Charles Oliveira fight very much. I'm a big fan of the Patrick Cote, Tiago Alves fight. So this isn't a star-studded card. This is not the kind of card that you're going to call your buddies before it starts and say, we got to buy this. Now, I would disagree and say the main event is a fight everyone should watch because the first fight between Rumble and DC was really, really good. Um, but I understand. There's not a lot of heat there. I mean, DC's kind of pumping things up a little bit last week at the conference call. 
you know, Anthony Johnson, you know, had a couple things to say. I put a story out with him today on Fox Sports that you can read. So there's a little bit of trash talk back and forth. But I think everyone knows that, you know, this is a rematch that's happening that's necessary. But we still have the John Jones question kind of looming overhead. And, uh, you know, there's just not as much buzz for this. And, and, and let's be honest, the UFC didn't really stack this card. They didn't really go out of their way to make this a can't-miss card. This feels like the kind of show that's going to sell a couple hundred thousand pay-per-views. And that's about it. Now, listen, there's nothing wrong with that depending on what you're trying to get out of a pay-per-view show. This very much feels like kind of a filler until we get to UFC 211. Because when you look at that UFC 211 card, that card is insane. I mean, you got Steve and Dos Anjos. You got Ioana Jacek against Jessica Andrade. You got Frankie Edwards. Edgar and Yair Rodriguez. Oh my God, do I love that fight. You got Henry Cejudo and Sergio Pettis. You got, I mean, there's just so many fights. Jorge Masvidal and Damian Maya. I mean, there's just so many fights on that card that you kind of feel like, man, couldn't they have given some of that to UFC 210? But that's not the case. And that's not the fight card we have coming up this weekend from Buffalo. But it's still a fun fight card. And I don't want to take anything away from it. But right now, let's talk to one of the guys who is in the uh, co-main event of this weekend's card. It's a big opportunity for him. He's on a, I believe, four-fight win streak. Big wins over Vitor Belfort. Avenged a previous loss to Uriah Hall. Has a win over Tiago Santos. Uh, we're going to talk right now to Gegard Mousasi as he gears up for Chris Weidman this Saturday night in Buffalo while also looking to go towards the final fight of his contract. This is the last fight on Gegard's current contract with the UFC. Will he stick around the UFC? Will he go somewhere else? We'll have to talk to him about that. So let's talk right now to uh, Gegard Mousasi. With UFC 210 just around the corner, the co-main event fighter joins us right now. He is taking on Chris Weidman in Buffalo. Welcome back, Gegard Mousasi. Gegard, how is everything? I'm good, but thanks for having me. Of course, of course. So, obviously, this is, uh, you know, this is a big moment. Uh, you know, this is a big fight. I know this is something you've wanted for a while. How is training and, you know, how is everything getting ready for Chris Weidman? Well, I'm more than ready. Uh, it's just uh, the annoying part is uh, I have to wait. It's, uh, the hard work is done. I'm just waiting to go to New York and uh, make the wait up and then uh, get the job done. Yeah. I know that this fight was rumored for a little while, and I know you had kind of called out Chris on Twitter and, you know, kind of, you know, roughly, you know, basically, you know, said that, you know, he, he wasn't accepting the fight. What what exactly happened from your perspective, and why did it take a little while longer for this fight to get made? Well, uh, you know, the UFC was telling me Chris Weidman is on holiday or Chris Weidman is this and that, so it's not coming from me. But, uh, you know, let's be honest, he got, he got two losses, so if it was me, I would have chosen easier fight also. But uh, eventually he took the fight, so, uh, but, uh, you know, kudos to him. What can I say? I'm, I'm just... Uh, I'm, I'm, I was just looking for a fight, and uh, a lot of fighters weren't available. So UFC was pushing for the Chris Weidman fight. Yeah, you know, in a weird this is this is such a this is such an interesting fight because you got Chris Weidman, who's a former champion, which is a great opportunity for you to showcase yourself. But he is also off two losses. So, I mean, where was your mindset at in terms of opponent? I mean, I, I, I know that you're probably not, you know, reading into it too much. You just want a top-ranked guy. So I assume Chris Weidman fits the bill, right? I mean, at the end of the day, the two straight losses don't necessarily knock off what he did in the past, which is he's a former middleweight champion and still one of the best five guys in the world. Yeah, 100%. No, I'm just looking forward to the fight. You know, uh, on any given day, the top five guys can beat each other. Uh, it's very evenly matched. Yo Romero, Chris Weidman, Jack Ray, uh, Luke Rockwell, so they're all evenly matched, you know, any given day the guys can beat each other. Michael Bisping is the weakest and uh, he's the champion, so, but he will be gone soon. Uh, <laughs> that's one thing for sure. Uh, and uh, so one of those four guys is a tough, tough, tough opponent to face. Yeah. And, uh, so let's see how it goes. Yeah. What did you what did you think of Chris's last two fights? I mean, you know, he had some moments against Rockhold. He he was winning some moments there against Rockhold, and then, you know, he got caught and made a mistake, and then kind of the same thing against Joel Romero. In a lot of ways he was winning the early part of that fight, and then Joel came back later. So neither one of them were like blowouts or, or early round knockouts, but what did you think of those two fights as much as you've seen them? Well, he's, he's one of the best guys. Uh, he was evenly matched uh, against both of those guys. Uh, against Joe Romero, he made a mistake. 
but Joe Romero was doing light on the in the first round because you know he, he always does that. He he is worried about his cardio, so he he paces himself. Uh, against Luke Rockhold, I, uh, you know I think Luke Rockhold is a better fighter, and uh, but he's he's a guy he's gonna come come to fight, especially this fight. He, he will come forward, you know. But I think I prefer I am um, let's say. I got the skills to make it easy. Yeah. You know, when you look at Chris Weidman, you know, he, he is known from his wrestling background as he showed off in the first fight with Anderson Silva before the knockout. He showed that off in a lot of his fights, but he has worked a lot on his boxing. But, you know, every time you face a guy like this, Gegard, people say they'll strike with you. People say they will stand with you. But, you know, once you get into the octagon, it's a much different story. Do you expect any different from Chris? I mean, not to give away your strategy, but, you know, do you kind of anticipate, you know, maybe he'll come out and try to throw hands early, but then, you know, as a wrestler, he's going to fall back on those takedowns yeah 100 percent. of course he's gonna first let's uh, exchange a little bit with me so once he goes for the takedown i'm more uh, surprised let's say but uh, at the end of the day he's trying to put the pace uh, he's gonna work on conditioning and he's gonna come forward that's that's his right way of fighting but i think he really underestimated my uh stand-up when He's gonna be. He's not. He's not gonna come forward as as much as he thinks he can. So, uh, you know, I, I've seen his face. He's a he's a guy who brings the fight. But uh, I think my stand up is way way much better than him. And I, you know, I feel I'm, I have the best stand up in the middleweight. That's the, that's why I think uh, the fight will be heavily favored to me. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, Gegard, you go out there and fight your fight. You can't really worry too much about what your opponent is going to come at you offensively outside of countering him. But at the end of the day, you want to go out there and do what you want to do in this fight. But is there any part of you that wonders or, or just, you know, out of curiosity that Chris might try to play it safe because he is coming off two losses and a third loss would be devastating. I mean, there's just no way around that. Even if he's losing to the best guys in the world, and obviously you're one of the best guys in the world, it's still three losses in a row. No one wants that. So, I mean, is there any part of you that wonders, you know, would he play it safe? Well, he's not going to play it safe because if he doesn't push the pace and come forward, he's a sitting duck. Um, but he has to understand I've been working on my wrestling every day almost. Every day I've worked on my wrestling. Uh, my takedown defense is... Uh, uh, he won't take me down. That, that I can guarantee. I know people have seen me and him take down, so... They, uh, they look at old fights, but he has to come forward. Otherwise, it's going to be an easy fight for me, and he knows that. And uh, So he will, he will try to push the pace, but that's where he, he's uh, sadly mistaken. He's not going to come forward as, he, as much as he thinks. Yeah. You, uh, you know, you, you've made some... I'm, I'm, some... I'm, I'm, I'm going to say... Uh, he, he, he should worry about takedowns himself, because uh, at the end of the day, I will, I will look for the takedowns. Uh, you know he's a good wrestler, but this is different fighting. This not uh, this not wrestling. Yeah. I set up punches and uh, takedowns. You know I will surprise him also. So he should become uh, prepared in all areas because uh, top, if I if I get top position on him, he's, he's in trouble. You know every time I get top position on any fighter, you know I defeated them. So and my top position is one of my uh, biggest strengths. So I'm gonna look for that also. Yeah. You know, from top to bottom, I know you do respect what Chris Weidman brings in this fight, but, you know, this is mixed martial arts. But if you look at striking, if you look at wrestling, if you look at grappling, if you look at all the different, you know, avenues coming together, do you just feel at the end of the day you're just better than Chris Weidman everywhere? I mean, I know you're not trying to disrespect the guy, but do you feel like no matter where this fight goes, you can beat him? Well, I, I, you know, I, I respect the guy. I, I, I like him. I, he seems like a nice guy. Uh, nothing against the guy, but, uh, He's just too slow. He's just too slow. Uh, he takedowns. Uh, he just more grabs and pulls the leg towards him. Uh, he's not a real, uh, you know, he's solid. He's solid everywhere, but he's not that, you know, I think um, my stand-up is done very well, you know, and I work a lot on the takedown defense. So he has to be on, I'm in top, I'm in my prime. He has to be in top condition and has a lot of luck to beat me. Uh, that's all he should uh, hope for. Yeah. 
you, uh, you know, th- this run you've been on, Gegar, you know, you've been knocking on the door of getting into title contention for a little while now. Uh, and I know you talked about it a little bit on the conference call yesterday, but the state of the middleweight division is kind of a mess right now because you got, you know, Michael Bisping going to fight George St. Pierre. You got Yoel Romero, who's the number one, legit number one contender. You got yourself and Chris Weidman. Then you got Jacare and Robert Whitaker. I mean, what are your thoughts right now? I mean, it's a little disheartening that, you know, even with a fifth straight win, like it it doesn't seem like you're going to be guaranteed much of anything considering, you know, what's happening with with Bisping, what's happening with Yoel. I mean, obviously you're not going to sit out for a year and wait. So, I mean, is it is it disappointing or disheartening as you as you make this run and, and, and you kind of have no control over what comes next? Yeah, definitely. You know, at first they made the Ben Henderson fight that didn't make any sense, or the number one contender didn't fight then. Then now they're making the GSP fight, and Mighty Bisping hasn't fought for a long time. Uh, so the number one contender has to wait again. Uh, if the number one contender would have fought in those two fights, I would have been next by now. But uh, because of UFC making these silly, silly fights, I don't know. You know, uh, the, they get pushed around. So now, if I win, I have to put everything on the line again and get another win, and then maybe I'm next. And still, maybe, maybe, because who knows what kind of fight they're gonna make after this. But uh, like I said, it's you know, I deserved it. I think Jocker has deserved this shot already. I need to get this in first, but and then you Romero has deserved this shot. So. Why aren't we getting our title shots? Yes. You know, what can I say? It's, uh, and uh, they're just stalling now. I hear GSP wants to fight in January or whatever. You know, make GSP fight Anderson Silva. What is this for fight they're making? If they want to have a super fight, make GSP versus uh, Anderson. Yeah. How much? Why, is- why for the title? He, he, even, even if he wins, he's going to vacate the title. It's simple as that. He's not going to defend against the top middleweight. He's just looking for a fight, and then he will go. He will go fight somebody else. Yeah. How much of this, in your opinion, Gay Guard, do you believe is the UFC, and how much of this do you believe is Bisping, you know, making his request to have this fight versus the UFC wanting to make this fight? I, don't, I just, I think it's interesting because I think everyone plays a part, but as, as a guy who this, you, this affects you. I mean, this absolutely affects you. How, how, who, who do you think this really comes down to? Well, I, you know, uh, yes, I, I know Michael Bisping. I like the guy. I met him a couple times. You know, he's going to do what is good for him and his family. He's going to try to make some money and uh, retire. So you cannot blame the guy that wants to make money and uh, uh, take care of the future of the of his family. Uh, you can't blame the guy. Uh, I blame, if I would blame, I would blame UFC for making those fights. They shouldn't make those fights. Mm-hmm. Like I said, they should have made Anderson versus GSP because they're not. Uh, GSP hasn't fought for three years in this. In not, in never fought in middleweight. How can he get a title shot? Uh, doesn't doesn't make any sense. Make the, make a different fights. You know, give GSP against I don't know wh- whoever in the middleweight. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with you. And I know, you know, with, with that being said, Gegard, as much or as little as you want to talk about this, I mean, from my understanding, you know, you are coming up to the end of your contract with the UFC. I mean, does any of this play a part in your decision-making about the future? Or I, I don't know. You tell me when you see these kind of things happening. Well, you know, I don't know. You, you, uh, I, uh, you know, I defeated, uh, I defeated uh, Peter Belfort. He's making tons of a lot more money than me. I defeated Dan Henderson. He's making tons of more money than me. I have defeated Mark Hunt. He's making hundred. He's making eight hundred thousand uh, fights. Uh, you know, I can beat Mike Bisping. Everyone, uh, the odd makers, would. Uh, he's made even before he was champion. He was making a lot more than me. So, uh, what? Why? Why don't, don't I deserve to make some money? So it's uh, it comes all to this fight, and that's why I trained. You know, so hard for this fight. It's not because I want to beat Chris Weidman. It's because I need to get paid, and I'm going to get paid. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to beat Weidman because uh, he's settled. He's settled. I'm still hungry, and, you know, I'm focused. I've worked a lot for this fight. It's just to finish the contract strongly. Yeah, and then go out there and get paid what you're worth, right? 100%. How, how How is it possible... Mark Hunt making 800000 with a record of 10 of 10. He has a record of 10 wins, 10 losses. 
Look at my record. How the fuck is that possible? Yeah. I agree. I agree. You've you faced a, a a laundry list of a murderer's row of fighters, and uh, and yeah, I think you know as a top five guy, you deserve to get the deserve to get that paycheck. You've put in your licks. You've earned it. And let's be honest, the heavyweight division is the easiest division that there is. The guys are not that good. Let's be honest. The heavyweight divisions, there are a couple of fighters that are really good, and the rest is not that good. Yeah. Well, I hope uh, I hope it works out, and I know that you know you 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 take a shot on yourself, you know, putting yourself in a position like this, and you get a big win over Wyman. Uh, I think you deserve to get the big paycheck, and I hope that they come through for it because I I know I, I imagine you know this is where you want to be. You want to be in the UFC. You want to be in the best middleweight division in the world, and and that's you know ultimately you should be getting paid as one of the best in the world. As I say, show me the money. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, uh, gay guard. First, I, I, first, first, I need to win. Uh, then, uh, then, uh, <laughs> then I can have a big house. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, gay guard, it's always a pleasure speaking to you. I really appreciate the time. Safe training, obviously. Safe travels over to to Buffalo, and I look forward to seeing you in Buffalo next week. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. All right, talk, talk to you soon. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. A big thanks, of course, to gay guard Musasi. He returns this weekend against Chris Weidman in the co-main event from UFC 210. Right now, we're going to talk to one of the hottest prospects in the sport. And uh, if you watched uh, or you saw on Fox Sports a couple weeks ago, UFC President Dana White said he is keeping an eye on Mackenzie Dern. He already has an eye on her. She is on the UFC's radar. And uh, he quote, called her, quote-unquote, a little badass. Uh, Mackenzie Dern, of course, one of the top prospects in the sport. So let's talk to her about uh, her career as she continues to make her rise up in mixed martial arts ranks, as well as her hopes to eventually land that contract with the UFC. If you haven't heard my next guest's name, then you're apparently not a big mixed martial arts fan because uh, she is one of the top prospects in the sport. And as Dana White said just recently, she is already on his radar. We welcome into the show today, Mackenzie Dern. Mackenzie, how is everything? Everything's going good. Just finished training, so I'm happy, healthy. Everything's going great. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Um, I want to ask you first. I mean, you put in the hard work. You, you've, you've done so much in your athletic career, but what does it mean when you hear a guy like Dana White say, yeah, I'm paying attention. She's a little badass. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, for me, it's like, of course, like a big pleasure um, for to hear him say that, you know, like, you know, it's always good to to know that like your your hard work is going like noticed. Um, so to have like you know the main man Dana White like say something like that, that's really good. But really, just like makes me want to work that much harder and and kind of like prove everyone else, you know, like yeah, you know, like I am tough, you know, like I I can do this, you know. Uh, like he said, I, I also saw that he said like you know who knows like. It's way different when you fight the best in the, in, in the world, you know. So I definitely want to show that, like, I'm prepared to do that um, on the right time. Yeah. How have you balanced that, Mackenzie? Because, you know, you came into the sport, you know, so highly touted from your Brazilian jiu-jitsu background that day one, you know, you don't get the same wiggle room as other fighters do. Like, if you have, you know, a, you know, a, a quote-unquote off night and you don't have your best performance, you know, there's so many eyeballs on you that you don't necessarily get the the wiggle room some other fighters might get. I mean, is that tough or is that something you embrace? Like, how how do you approach that considering you don't, you know, you don't get a lot of leeway because people have so many, you know, have so many eyes on you from day one. Yeah, for sure that's, um, like, a big thing. Like, even when I say, like, kind of compare a little bit to Ronda Rousey, you know, like, um, people like, you know, make statements like, oh, you know, like maybe she can be like the next Ronda Rousey and stuff. Um, like I already know for sure that like, I won't be able to like submit, I mean, who knows, you know, but like, I won't have like that, you know, record where you submit the fights in 15 seconds, you know, and things like that. Uh, I think like Ronda, she, she did so much for the sport and, um, like, you know, her first fights, uh, I don't think anyone even, like, really watched them, you know what I mean? I think she kind of got more attention maybe, like, after her fifth or sixth fight, you know, like, when she was, like, um, starting to go and fight Misha Tate and everything. So even just, like, little things like that, you know, like, there's such a big difference from my first fight. Like, I, I never did amateur. I went straight to professional fighting. So even, like, from the very first fight was, like, this big, um, you know, just, like, not just the jiu-jitsu community, but everyone, like, was watching, you know, um, I think even the girls I'm fighting, um, they, like, fight me, 
you know, they already find me kind of like knowing who I am. It's not like I'm just some random person that they have no idea um, what they're doing. Like, I feel like they're fighting me, um, just kind of staying staying away from the ground, you know, not like really trying to fight me, like put their game first. You know, I think they're just trying to defend my game. So uh, it's definitely like a lot harder, I think. Um, it's a bigger obstacle, you know. But um, that for me, it's good, you know, just makes it work harder. Like I said, like uh, the more that they try to to like defend my takedowns or try to the more they're thinking about me like the more i'm working hard to to be like a better fighter no matter what they do you know so um i i'm i'm enjoying it you know i know like i have a big fan base um from the jiu-jitsu community going with me i'm not doing this by myself so i i I like it you know but like you said it's kind of it's kind of hard like anything i'm not used to this you know like anything i do it's like everyone notices everything like takes notice you know like they comment on everything so it's definitely a, a different experience but I, I i'm enjoying it you know like it's I, it's definitely not too hard for me it's it's pushing me to be better yeah well at the same time i imagine as you talk about with your opponents i mean you know everyone i'm sure would like to you know just like with ronda they want to be the person that, that beats ronda rousey it was a big thing <laughs> forever um so you got to imagine you're always getting the best out of people and in a way that's got to make the wins feel that much better because you know you know, they want to be the one to, to, to beat you. They want to be the one to kind of, you know, to take your hype away. I mean, that's just part of the sport, but that's got to make you feel good knowing that you've gone out and, and dominated your first three opponents. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, um, I, like like I said, you know, like we're not in the UFC yet, you know, so I know that each each person's going to get just tougher and tougher. Uh, I fought like a kickboxer. I fought like a, a grappler, and I fought um, uh, uh, like Golden Gloves boxer. So, it's like kind of cool to get different um, people that I'm fighting, but yeah, like even just I don't know, like the whole calling out and where you call people out and stuff. It's for me, it's so different to have that like so early on on the on the career. You know, like I can tell, like just like you said, you know, like I can definitely feel like that the people want to be like the one to stop like the the, the hype train. You know, like they want to be the one to put the brakes on everything. So uh, I definitely know that like everyone's coming out strong, and it's that that's what we need. You know, like not just for me but in general like just to show like that the woman's talent like we're getting better and better and like one day we can be good just like like good in the number of quantity and quality like the men you know like right now we have like very few girls um like for sure the girls are so good but we just don't have that many women in mma like guys you know so there's less great women than there are great guys you know so as long as everyone is bringing their best like the talent is just going to keep getting better and better yeah. Now there's been those comparisons and you brought it up. A lot of people keep saying you're the next Ronda Rousey. Now as a fighter, I imagine you don't want to be the next Ronda Rousey. You want to be the first Mackenzie Dern. But but I mean, how, you know, I, I mean, how do you feel about that that there's already people that are kind of comparing you to her or at least saying, you know, we think you could be the next, you know, the next big star, the next big, you know, women star in the sport. I mean, does it feel good? Do you have to do you have to put that on the back burner a little bit? Do you have, I mean, how do you handle that when you hear that comparison cuz Listen, Ronda Rousey, you know, she's, I mean, without Ronda Rousey, a lot of things, what's going on in women's mixed martial arts probably wouldn't be happening right now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, no, definitely, like, it's um, it's uh, some really huge, like, shoes to fill, you know. Um, I, no one's going to take away, like, everything that she's done for a woman's uh, MMA and everything, but I think, like, everyone has their own story, um, their own, like, you know, story to write and their own difference to make, so... Uh, definitely, like, I don't want to just be one more, uh, girl in the, in the strawweight division, you know, like, I want to make, like, a difference, and I want to, like, stand out and, and be something, uh, special, so, uh, when they, when I hear them saying that, you know, like, for me, that's good, just to hear that people, like, really believe in, like, my potential, and that, like, I can make, like, a huge difference in the women's MMA, um, but at the same time, like, I think that one of the best things that I have is, like, my team, you know, they're so good, like, to keep me, uh, to not let my head, like, go to the stars, you know, like, they keep me grounded all the time, you know, like, I'll finish one fight, and maybe, like, I won the fight, and there, my team is, like, the first one to be, like, okay, yeah, you didn't do this, you didn't do this, you didn't do this, you know, like, to always, like, keep me down and always just making me getting better and better, uh, I always say, like, our team, the MMA lab, they always, like, go for perfection, so, uh, we're definitely, like, trying to be, like, the best athlete, uh, female athlete out there, you know, so, it's, I, I can understand how people maybe, like, they say that, they say that, and, you know, I just keep putting it in the back of my mind, like, you know, I have so much to grow, 
And like, like you said, you know, I want to be the best, like, I want to be the first McKenzie, you know, so like, I, I really appreciate everyone saying that and like the fact that they believe in me, but I'm, I'm always keeping my feet grounded and just keep, keep working hard. Yeah. Well, that's what I said. I mean, I, I know it's a compliment. I know people mean it as a compliment when they say you're the next Ronda Rousey, but at the same time, you want to forge your own path in the sport, right? You want to kind of make your own way. You want to, you want to kind of forge your own path. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I, I think like, you know, me and Ronda, we have such different personalities you know i think like um i can bring a lot to to women's mma um but definitely like in a different way so hopefully hopefully everyone's right you know everyone who says that like i hope that i can uh you know be just just as big and hopefully even bigger than than what she has done for the sport too yeah now with that being said i know fighters are their own worst critics and i i read another interview where you know you you had some criticisms about your last performance uh you went to a decision for the first time i still thought it was a, a very dominant performance but where do you feel like you're at right now you know your head coach john crouch one of the best in the game so of course he's going to grade you and kind of help you with those performances but after three fights in your professional career like how how confident do you feel because when you hear dan Dana White say you're on the radar, a lot of people are immediately going to say, well, you know, we're, we're going to see McKenzie in the UFC this year. I think even you've stated you hope to do that this year. So where do you feel you're at in your mixed martial arts game? Uh, you know, I think like right now I feel um, that it's more like experience. Um, I definitely don't have like, I have competition experience jujitsu wise, uh, something that I think like no other girl in the UFC, like in, no other weight class, you know, like the same as Ronda had, with like her Olympic uh, judo and uh, Sarah McMahon with her Olympic, um, you know Holly Holm with her kickboxing. That that's like something my, my jiu jitsu like no I don't think anyone will be able to get to that um, years of experience that I have in jiu jitsu. So uh, for sure, like one thing I'm so confident in is my is my jiu jitsu. You know, but like my last fight, I went basically like three rounds standing up. You know, <laughs> so like something like that. Um, I know that I'm going to fight like tons of girls that maybe I won't even go to the ground, you know, like they'll have really good takedown defense or, or something like that, you know. So I think right now it's just getting that experience in to, um, to be prepared to, to be comfortable fighting anything and any type of strategy that the people do, you know. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy that I was able to go like the three rounds now and not, I don't know, maybe like submit all my fights and then just when I get into like a title belt, you know, like for the title in the UFC is my first time I have to go like five rounds, you know, like I'm, I'm glad to get this out of the way now and feel like, hey, it's OK. Like if you didn't take it down, you don't get frustrated like you can stand up too. you know, like get them to think about the stand up and then go for the takedown again, you know. Um, so for me, like I think right now is just to get the experience. And of course, like like unfortunately, like to getting the weight down, you know, um, I don't think uh like anyone, you know, they don't want some athlete, you know, that doesn't like keep missing weight or anything like that, you know. So I think right now is kind of like my trial and error uh, to try to figure out this weight thing and just get everything under control to get into the UFC and not have any more like hip, hip, hiccups, you know. Yeah. You mentioned it, so I might as well ask about it, McKenzie, is the weight issue, because, of course, people are going to bring that up because you, you, you miss weight a couple of times. Now, I know you come from a jiu-jitsu background, which is different than, like, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big wrestling guy, and wrestlers cut weight their entire lives. It's something that they're, they're built with, they grow up on. Now, I don't know exactly, you know, your, your weight-cutting history necessarily, but I got to imagine this is still a fairly new thing to you. So just like anything else, just like you're learning to throw a jab or learning to throw a right cross – this is a learning experience, right? Like, I don't I don't think it's fair to, to throw somebody under the bus for missing weight early. Yes, you should make weight, and yes, that's part of the job. But it's a, it's a learning process, right, just like anything else. Yeah, I think, like, the biggest thing is, um, you know, if, it's not even just, like, about me, but, like, there's someone else involved in this, you know, and that's the person I'm, that I'm fighting. So uh, I totally understand, like, um, to not, you know, to not give a – I don't want to give like any problems uh, or to be unfair to the pers the people that are accepting to fight me and everything, um, and that's like really what I I feel the worst about you know. But um, thankfully, like both the girls, they both um, you know wanted to fight me still no matter what. Um, but yeah, like with jiu jitsu, it's we fight you know like we cut weight and we fight on that weight you know like as soon as you step up the scale you have to go fight you know. So uh, I never like done this like dehydration where you have to cut so much water and all these things. Like, for me, it's always been a, a very, like, you know, five pounds, six pounds that I cut for jujitsu, and I go and fight like that. So we, we never, like, really fight dehydrate or anything like this. And 
now for MMA going down to 115, it's a really big weight cut for me. Um, and and honestly, I think like the biggest thing is just to be like I'm still fighting jiu-jitsu a couple tournaments this year, like so far. Um, and it's like you cut for the jiu-jitsu and then my weight goes up, you know, and then I need to cut like way more down for MMA fight and then my weight goes up and then I cut down a little bit for jiu-jitsu. So it's like just this this huge roller coaster that doesn't stop like continuously. You know, I think a lot of MMA fighters, they do maybe like, I don't know if they do like four fights a year. That's four times they cut weight, you know, and I have to cut weight like, you know, six times in, you know, three months, you know, so it's... um. It's really hard on my body, and, like, I'm just trying to figure everything out and, and trying to figure out, like, what's the best way to cut weight for MMA and everything. So, like you said, it's uh, it's really – I'm learning it, and I, I feel bad, you know, for the athletes. I'm really trying hard, but I, I think it's going to it's gonna get under, under control for sure. Yeah. Do you feel like in a perfect world, strawweight is your division, or would a flyweight division be more beneficial? Because I think a lot of people, myself included, would like to eventually see a flyweight division, you know, in the UFC for women. I think, you know, Beck Rawlings, who I know very well, she struggled, you know, and it just hurts her to get down to 115. And, uh, you know, Jessica I is a, is a very small bantamweight. She would probably do better if they had a 125 division, so she wouldn't be so over, you know, so undersized. So what is it for you? I mean, do you feel like strawweight really is the best division for you or or if they had a 125 pound division that you would go there uh i mean for sure like the first thing i think that they definitely should make a 125 division uh even if i was or wasn't to fight you know i think like like you said there's so many girls that they could have like some great fights um and just be a great division to have but you know i think like for me I, i'm short you know i i think that straw weight is is the right weight class for me um uh, I don't know. I, I'm I'm kind of I'm a little bit thick, you know. I'm like half American, half Brazilian, so I, I, <laughs> I'm I'm kind of like a a thicker girl, you know. Um, so it's definitely like harder harder for me. But I think that uh, that straw weight is like a good weight class for me. I think um, the strength wise, the the height wise, everything like that. Um, you know, maybe 125. The girls might have a a bigger a longer reach, you know, for me. Um, but definitely, like I I have said before. If I win the when I win the the strawweight belt, you know, and if they make the one twenty five, I would like to go and, and win that belt too, you know. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. Now, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I believe you did say, Do you feel like you will be in the UFC this year? And I know Legacy has treated you phenomenally, so I don't want to take anything away from them, but do you feel like by the end of this year we will be talking about your first fight in the UFC? I really hope so, Damon. Like that's that's the plan, you know, like I'm doing everything I can to uh have my debut this year. Um, you know, I'm talking like with my manager, with my team, they all know like that, that's what I, that that's my goal. So I, I really believe like, like when I put like one goal in my mind, like I will do everything I can to do it. Like maybe I can't accomplish it, but I know I will give like my hundred percent to make that happen. So I really believe like this year I'll be in the UFC. Yeah. Now with that, you know, with getting to the UFC and knowing, as I said earlier, you have so many eyeballs on you already. Um, you know, you do jujitsu. You, you're obviously very accomplished in jujitsu and you still get a lot of attention from that. But, you know, day one you sign with the UFC, there's going to be a lot of people throwing things at you. They're going to want you to do modeling. They're going to want you to do acting. They're going to want you to do, you know, a lot of sponsorships, endorsements, things like this. I mean, Kind of a two-part question. One, you know, have you mentally kind of prepared for that? Because there's more that goes into the UFC these days than just fighting. And I think we all know that with the success of Conor McGregor and Ronda Rousey and people like that. But part two, how do you stay grounded? How do you stay focused on the fight? Because ultimately that's what's going to get you where you want to be to be a champion is the fight. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, even just like my fights now, um, you know, during my camp for like my last fight, for example... Man, I was, like, traveling almost every weekend, you know, before before my camp. So, like, maybe the f last four weekends before, I was out of town, you know. And it's things like this that, you know, I was, like, talking to my coach. Like, man, it's so hard to stay, like, not to stay concentrated, but it's hard to keep, like, everything under control, you know, like the diet, uh, your training, um, just everything, your mind. Like, you know, people pu pulling you this way, pushing you that way. No, you need to do this and this. And all you want to think about is the fight, you know. So, um, definitely, like, like I said, you know, like, I don't want to just be one more person and win, like, you know, three fights, lose one, win another two, okay, maybe have, like, a draw, you know, like, I want to go in, like, when it, when I go to the UFC, like, I'm there, like, I want to go there to, like, make, make noise and go all the way to the top, you know, like, to make a big difference, so, 
I'll be like fully committed, um, but I, I don't know. Let's see. Let's see what what things will come, what opportunities will will happen. Uh, definitely, I think my whole team and and myself, we like understand like what will be right at the right times. You know, I def- I think we won't put anything that will affect our results. So I, I'm really um, comfortable with who's by my side, and I think we'll make the right decisions. Yeah, and it sounds like you're very focused on fighting and very focused on being a champion. I mean, you've been a champion so many times over in jiu-jitsu it sounds like the <laughs> ultimate goal you know is to be champion i mean all the other stuff is nice and the money and the endorsements and you know hey let's put you on dancing with the stars whatever the case may be it all sounds great <laughs> but it sounds like ultimately the goal is you want to be you want to be ufc champion yeah for sure i mean i don't know like i know there's a lot of girls that like like to fight um like they're brawlers you know like they, for them fighting is like so much fun like for yeah for sure it's like good you know it's it's I, I, for me, I honestly, I can't say like, it's fun, you know, like, I don't like to get punched in the face, you know what I mean? Like, for me, I, I train like as hard as I do, like, to try to not get punched in the face and try to like, put my jujitsu and like, be the better person, like without, I like, I'm not the person who said like, oh, man, I'm gonna like, break her face in or stuff like that, you know, like, like, okay, yeah, this is a fight, but this is like my job. And like, I have one goal, you know, like, that's to get out of the fight with less injury as possible to me. And to be like the champion and show like my jiu-jitsu. My jiu-jitsu is like so forward and so aggressive. Like I, I don't really have a boring jiu-jitsu. So I know for sure like my MMA fights won't be boring. Um, so as long as people like enjoy to watch my fights, um, I think everything else will come into place. You know, like I love to dance, you know. So like I, I, I'm not against like to do Dancing with the Stars or to do any of like these things for sure. Like I, I'll be totally for it. But I think like if, if all these things happen and I, and I don't win any fights, you know, it won't, it won't mean anything, you know what I mean? Like, I think what's, like, the best is to be, you know, like, maybe to have, like, kind of this, um, like, pretty, like, kind of pretty girl profile, you know, like, it's different. Not that there aren't pretty girls, I don't want to say that, you know, but, you know what I mean? Like, it's something different, like, people see, like, this taboo, like, oh, all women that do martial arts, like, you know, like, they lose their femininity, their f- femininity, I think that's the word, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and so if, like, doesn't matter to have like this image like oh like a pretty girl and stuff but you know you don't have the the talent or the hard work to back it up you know so the results to back it up so for me anything that will be offered for sure I'm like not against any of that but uh for me like I want to show that I'm like a real athlete and that like this I take this serious everything else that will come I think will all fall into place um like coming with the results, you know? Yeah. I've had that conversation with Paige Van Zandt before that, you know, I know people, you know, talk about her looks, but ultimately she said, you know, when I get in the cage, I, I'm in there to fight. I'm in there to win. I'm in there to battle and, and get a victory. And all the other attention is great. And she understands that, you know, I understand where it comes from. That's just part of, uh, the I don't know our society I guess is the best way to yeah, say yeah. it but but at the end of the day she's a fighter and it sounds like you're very much in the same mindset like I appreciate the compliments and the offers and all this but at the end of the day you want to get in there and win a fight yeah for sure you know um exactly like we don't want people just to say oh she's just like a pretty face you know she doesn't even like really fight that good you know she doesn't win anything you know like we don't want that you know like we want to show like hey you can be like if you like tattoos you know you can have tattoos if you like to have you know, um, whatever, if you like to dance, you can dance, you know, but like, this is what we do. Like we take this serious. This is our job. Like we chose this for our life, you know? So we're not here just like, just to have fun and just to like, uh, maybe call attention for that. You know, like I, I take this serious. So, um, I like, like you said, like, I understand too, where, where it comes from, you know, like I'm not against it. I'm not like, Oh, I, I wish people would stop, you know, commenting about the looks, you know, like it, it's part of it, you know, but uh, definitely I'm focused on to be the champion and people to like, you know, like my, 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 my style of fighting too. Yeah. And your philosophy about not getting hit in the face in a very aggressive jujitsu style, you know who that reminds me of is a very, <laughs> very, is a very, very good fighter right now. A guy by the name of Damian Maya who doesn't, yeah. get, doesn't get hit very much, but man, I love watching that guy on the ground. Cause when he takes somebody down, I know it's going to be a show. And it kind of reminds me of that. Listen, I'm with you. I don't know anyone that really likes to get punched in the face. I kind of feel like they need to go see a psychologist or something. Like, you should not want to get punched in the face, right? That's kind of the goal, so. Right. You know, like, I understand that people want to, like, punch in the face, you know, but to get, like, to be there and get punched in the face, too, you know, like, man, it's not fun. You're, you get punched in the nose, your eyes get watery, you know, like, 
you get like cauliflower ear. I don't, <laughs> I don't want any of that stuff, you know. So I'm just trying to train the hardest I can to be uh, the best possible uh, Mackenzie I can be. Yeah. Before I get you out of here, Mackenzie, obviously, you know, congratulations again on your last victory. That was just recently, so I don't want to jump too far ahead. But, but you know, I know you've got, I believe you have a jiu-jitsu tournament coming up in the near future. But what, what is immediately coming up next for you? Uh, thank you. Um, I, so I have, I will be going to Brazil on Sunday and I'll be training down there, um, until I go to Abu Dhabi. I have the world pro, uh, championships in Abu Dhabi. That's like, uh, April 25th. Then I'll do the world championships, um, in the, in California, the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu world championships. Like I'm two time world champion. So I'm going to go to defend my title. And like I, I don't. It's, it's not a goodbye, you know. Um, especially like for the jiu-jitsu community, if they hear that that I'm saying like my goodbye, they'll be so sad, you know. It's definitely like not a goodbye, but uh, that will kind of be like my last uh, big jiu-jitsu tournament um, before like I do the full commitment to MMA, you know. Like now, I really decide it's like the time I need to to focus 100. percent So the world championships will be like kind of my my i'll see you later you know <laughs> see you see you in a while to jiu-jitsu um and then hopefully i'm trying to really get a fight like maybe july 21st um with lfa so we'll see that that's what we have in the plans for the next couple months yeah hopefully the ufc i would love to you know they're doing international fight week the week of july 8th hopefully you know there's a chance you get out there and uh you know get your face seen out there a little bit i i think it would be a great place for uh for the ufc to bring you out there maybe one more fight and then sign with the ufc i'm not that i need to play matchmaker or anything here mckenzie i'm just coming up with <laughs> ideas so you know yeah yeah for sure <laughs> no it's it's awesome i just was at the um mma awards um i did like uh it was really cool to meet so many um great athletes and so many people it's just like really cool to see like this new co like it's a new community for me you know like i came from the jiu-jitsu world so to meet um, all these great mma fighters and mma fans it's really cool to like get to keep meeting people and um just you know start to create that relationship now yeah, excellent. Well, Mackenzie, thank you so much for taking the time. I really do appreciate it. I'm sure we'll have you on the show again soon. Uh, safe travels down to Brazil on Sunday. Best of luck in the jiu-jitsu tournaments. And uh, I'm sure we'll speak probably before your next fight. But thank you again for taking the time. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, Damon. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right, talk to you soon. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Of course, a huge thank you to Mackenzie Dern. Keep an eye on her. I'm telling you right now, she's going to end up in the UFC sooner rather than later. And uh, it's always better to be ahead of the race than behind it. And so that's a name you need to keep an eye on because she is going to be, uh, in my estimation, a big, big star. She's got some development to do. There's no doubt about it. She's got you know, some time to evolve her striking game. And, of course, we talked about the weight cutting. So all those things have to happen. I understand. She's a couple fights into her career. But the potential is there. And I think when you look at the star power and the fact that so many people are buzzing about her, as long as she can continue to deal with the pressure and deal with, um, you know, the anticipation of her making it to the UFC and she can live up to that a little bit, maybe not as much as some pressure will be put on her to be the next quote-unquote Ronda Rousey, that kind of craziness. But as long as people can, uh, you know, can follow along and, and, and watch on her journey and not put too much pressure on her, I think she will eventually make her way to the UFC and make an impact in the UFC. But that's a deep division. Women's strawweight is tough. That is not a division that's easy to jump into and make a big impact on day one. So give it some time. She will evolve, and I think you will see her in the UFC one day, like I said, sooner before later. Right now, our final interview of the day comes with another fighter coming at UFC 210 this week, and his name is Will Brooks. He's a former Bellator champion. Now he is in the lightweight division of the UFC. Had a great conversation with uh, Will ahead of this fight card, talking about his loss to Alex Oliveira, coming back and fighting now Charles Oliveira, you know, making waves in this lightweight division and continuing his path towards what he hopes will be an eventual title shot. So let's talk right now to ill Will Brooks. One of the top lightweights in the world makes his return to action at UFC 210 in Buffalo. We welcome back to the show, Will Brooks. Will, how is everything? Everything's great, man. Just amazing. Just at home with my wife and my daughter right now. My daughter who's trying to climb up on the couch right now <laughs> as, as I speak. But, um... Yeah, man, everything's been great. Just working hard, trying to get ready for this next fight. Yeah, I saw your tweet. I think it was yesterday or the day before that. It sounds like uh, you're ready to get in there right now. Yeah, man, I mean, it, it tends to happen. You know, I do um, I do a little bit longer of training camps than most guys do. Uh, a lot of guys do eight-week training camps. I do 12 weeks, just, uh, just, how, just how I like to operate. And, you know, at one point, 
uh, you just kind of hit that wall where you're just like, man, the monotony of it all just gets to you and you just get bored with it. But, you know, I always expect it to happen when it happens. I just get through it and the next week we're, you know, refreshed and ready to go again, you know. Yeah, absolutely. You're not a guy who clearly has ever dealt with much loss in your career, only two in your entire career. But how much how much does it eat away to you when you're sitting on a loss? Like, I imagine you want to get back in there and just, like, you know, get that bad taste out of your mouth as soon as possible. Yeah, honestly, man, I really – I don't get bothered by losing. I, I don't know what it is. It's – um I'm conditioned to, like, the idea of competition. You know, I've been competing my entire life, uh, wrestling, playing football, and throughout my career, you know, you deal with losses. You deal with winning, and you have to be able to take both of them with the same, with the same attitude, you know. You, you hate to lose, but, you know, you have, to, you have to be okay with it. It's just it's the nature of the beast, and, you know, part, uh, also a combination of having confidence and um, just having a short memory is just one of those things that I've always been – uh, condition to have by all the coaches and all the individuals that I've had in my life. So losing has never been a problem for me. You know, like you have these guys who lose and then they question everything about themselves. They, they question it. They, they, what am I doing? What I do wrong? What I do this? What I do that? Blah, blah, blah. For me, I, I don't think much of it, man. I just get back in the gym and get back to work. Yeah. Was it, I mean, it sounds like you moved on, but I mean, you know, there were a lot of people, myself included, that were kind of banging the drum after that last one because of, you know, what happened with, uh, with, with you know, Alex Oliveira's weight. I mean, he was so much, so far overweight. And then obviously we saw stepping into the cage, he was so much bigger. And now he's fighting at welterweight. I mean, does any of that play a factor or do you, do you really just let it go that soon? Because I think a lot of people were angry for you in a way. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I honestly, I let it go. It was more, the thing that I was more frustrated with was myself overall is the, because I, I believe that I'm an intelligent fighter. I believe that my abilities, uh, regardless of who it is, no matter what weight, my abilities translate to anybody. I should be able to neutralize and beat anybody. And um, my intelligence as a fighter, my fight IQ allows me to do that, you know. So uh, Oliver missing the weight by how much did he miss? I never thought twice about it yet. It annoyed me because it's the professionalism, you know, it's the taking your job serious. That's the thing that I, I, I have a lot of pride in, you know, and um, I think in this sport, we're still trying to make our way into the mainstream. We're trying to make our way into that, that idea that this is a professional sport. This is not a, like a, a size show circus type of deal. So when a guy misses weight in that fashion, that frustrates me because not only are you embarrassing yourself, you're embarrassing. I, I, again, him being bigger, him being this, and him being that, it means nothing to me. I know my abilities. I know my skill set. I still should have been able to make adjustments in that fight. You know, even though he was a he was a bigger guy, uh, even though I had popped my rib, I should have been able to focus up, lock it in, make the adjustments that I needed to make, and come out with the W. And on that's my fault that I didn't get that done. Yeah, that's a that's a tremendous attitude. Because I tell you what, that, I remember the night of that fight. I mean, I was crazy on Twitter, and I wasn't in the fight. And I was just like, "This is ridiculous." <laughs> and your teammates were coming. I know American Top Team. You guys are all like brothers. I mean, I know a lot of your teammates came out and spoke about it, things like that. I mean, um, like I said, I think that 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 speaks volumes about uh, how you know how uh, the kind of passion people have for you as fans, journalists, whatever you want to say. Because there's a lot of people that were that were upset about that. But it seems like you took it better than even yeah. I did, which is kind of funny. Yeah, man, and, and and to be honest, when I when I got back, when I had jumped on social media and let people know I was okay, and you know I had this whole stream of um, tweets from different fans and people and people who are, weren't even my fans that would just let me know that they support me, all these different things, and it was just incredible to to get that type of reaction because you you naturally you don't you don't expect that you know you don't expect people. And I think that's the beautiful thing about mixed martial arts is that people can connect with you on such an individual level that they invest a little bit more than the normal, the typical fan that would like invest their, their passion into like if their sports team, because there's multiple individuals on that team, you know, but the mixed martial arts is an individual competitor. So people in like have their, they invest in you as an individual. So to get those reactions of people being, you know, so supportive and, you know, being on my team and sticking with me, understanding the circumstances. And it was just incredible, man. I appreciated it greatly. 
Yeah. Now, now, how important is it after that? You say you let that go, and like you said, because you know you're coming from a wrestling background. I'm a big wrestling guy myself. You know, losses, wins happen. I mean, I'm a I'm friends with Kyle Snyder, who's you know one of the greatest wrestlers in the world. But even he's had to deal with defeats recently. You know what I mean? But you bounce back and, yeah. and you go back in there and you uh, and you compete and you know do a great job in the next match. And that's just part of that mentality that I think wrestlers have. Um, but how, how does it does it you know does it put any extra not pressure but like excitement or anticipation of going in there? And getting a big win in your next fight does any of that add on or, or how do you how do you feel going into the next one well i mean you still as a competitor I, I have that that desire that drive and not so much because i lost the fight but more or less just i'm just ready to go back and compete just because in that fight i felt like i was when i go back and watch the fight i was like man i was winning that fight you know so that actually that actually helps you a little bit more to remind you of who you are and what you're capable of that, you know, I went in there, a guy's over by six pounds that the night of he's clearly probably a little bit over even bigger than that, you know, and, um, and I popped my rib and I was still actually in that fight and still doing the things that I was needed that was necessary to win that fight. It's just that one. And look, it's, it's just like football. People say like, it's a game of inches. And I think the same thing in regards to mixed martial arts is, it's a it's a game of inches. Just that one time where you slip up mentally, you slip up physically, that could be the end of it all, you know? And I was just watching it. I was watching that fight, and I saw it. I was like, dang it, there it was right there, the mental lapse that I had. So being able to watch that and go over into this na- next training camp is like, hey, you didn't lose any steps. You didn't take any steps back. It was just one of those things where you need to work on making sure that not ever – do you lose that or you have that moment of um, confusion or uncertainty? Let's work on that. Let's get back to being mentally connected. So going into this next fight or training camp, I'm not thinking about coming off of a loss. I'm thinking about, hey, let's keep building on the things that we've done so far and continue to get better. Yeah. You know, when you when you signed with the UFC, Will, it was a big moment because a lot of people had kind of pegged you as a, you know, as a future champion, a potential champion. Obviously, you have Bellator as the champion. Uh, how would you say your, your time in the UFC has been so far? I mean, you're only two fights into your career. You're about to go to a third. Uh, but would you say you're happy, you know, being in the UFC? Would you say that, you know, you feel like you, you still need to establish yourself a little bit more? I mean, how do you feel, you know, going into your third fight in this organization? Oh man, I've had a blast, man. I, I, I that's one thing that I was I was a little concerned with. I wasn't sure how things were going to go, you know. Especially being that I'm coming from another organization, and, you know, I have a little bit of backing, you know, as far as being a a, a, a former or a champion of the pro, the previous organization. I was expecting some people to, you know, in the, who worked in the organization, who worked in the UFC in the back in the back in the background, kind of to treat me like, you know, like, who are you to come in here? You know what I mean? Like, kind of kind of treat you not great, you know? But, man, since I've stepped in the door, I've got nothing but love from everybody. It's just been incredible, an incredible experience. And I honestly, man, again, there is the fact that I haven't been there that long, but just my two experiences has just been incredible, and I can't wait to – you know, get deeper into my my UFC career and um, just see how things go from there just because the passion of the people that are working in the background, how dedicated they are, how hard they work, that's just inspiring, you know, and um, I'm, I'm excited to be to build a, a relationship and build a, a home with the UFC. Yeah, this is going to sound like a really stupid question, but I'm going to ask it anyways, Well, <clears throat> only because, like I said, a lot of people, myself included, you know, kind of pegged you as that guy that would, you know, make that charge towards the top five. And I know it's a tough question to answer, you know, coming off a loss, going into your next fight. But do you still feel like at some point we will be talking about Will Brooks as a title contender, as a guy who will be fighting for that UFC belt one day? Dude, that's not a that's not a stupid question at all. I, I think that's a reasonable question because I, I think that from what I've put on display, my my skills and my abilities and what I bring to the table, there's no reason not to ask ask that question and to answer that question. Yes, I will be. Look, I, I and I know it's it's expected of everybody to say the same thing. Oh yeah, I'm going to be the lightweight champion. Blah blah blah, and all these different things. But I, I'm, I'm not saying this. I'm, I believe this. I'm not saying it because I'm supposed to say this. I'm saying it because I believe it. I know my capabilities. I know that when Will Brooks shows up tonight of any competition, 
before that, when I sign my name on a contract, I know my abilities, I know my skill level, I know that I'm able to be anybody at any point in this game. So I'm I'm very very I'm very very confident that I will be the lightweight champion at some point, and maybe it's not, maybe it's not going to be next week or the week after or whatever. You know, <laughs> of course not. You know, you know, but I'm just being being uh, being a little like you know whatever. But uh, you know, but it's it's going to happen. It's just I just know it. I feel it in my bones. That's part of the reason why I made the switch to the UFC. You know, I could have stayed with my previous organization. Um, I had a great opportunity there. They put a gr- they they gave me a great offer that I could have built on. But I felt it in my bones. It's like, man, this is time. It's time to go. It's time to do this. And again, this is part of the reason why I'm not. I, I wasn't hurt by losing. I wasn't devastated by losing. I wasn't upset about losing because I still know the game plan. I see. I still see the finish line. It's just, I'm just. I'm going through the journey. I'm going through the marathon, and I see a window. I I still see the window that is open there in this lightweight division, and it's just. I just need to lock it in and get it done. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So to that point, you know, coming back for your next fight, you get a guy in Charles Oliveira. Something about you and Oliveira's apparently recently. Uh, you, you get you <laughs> yeah. get you get Charles Oliveira, who unfortunately kind of dealt with the same thing your last opponent did, where he was struggling to make weight, but now he's moving up to lightweight. So we hope he will be okay making weight. But he's an exciting right, guy, yeah. and he's had experience at lightweight before. I mean, when he suffered a loss, I think it was to Cowboy Cerrone. He was on a pretty solid run at that point you know, going into, uh, you know, when he finally dropped down to featherweight. So what do you think about Charles? You know, what, what do you expect out of this fight? I expect he's got to be exactly who he always is. You know, I think he's a very slick jujitsu guy. He has a lot of confidence in his skills. He's very um, flamboyant with his technique. He's very, he's, he, he takes, he, he'll take a risk. He's not uh, scared to roll to something or, um, you know, take a chance and try to throw up a guillotine, throw up a, and the kind of choke, throw up a dart choke, you know, throw up triangles, different things like that. And he's very good at, he's very smooth with his transitions. So it's one of those things where you have to be very, very conscious of every single position that you're in because this guy can snap you off at any second, you know, and, and the second that you think you've defended that, that submission, he'll roll to something else. So, uh, and even, it, even when it's striking, I've watched him and his striking is a lot of people don't talk about it, but his striking is very, very high level, uh, very, very technical. Uh, maybe a lot of people may not look at it because it's a very technical Muay Thai type of style where there's not a lot of flash to it, but he's very accurate with his, his clinch game, his elbows, his knees. So he's a well-rounded athlete. So, uh, it's going to be a very, very exciting night. I'm, I'm very excited about competing against him and making sure that I'm ready to go out there and beat him. Yeah. Is it, you know, when you're a fighter, I mean, ultimately you go out there to win against no matter who you face, whether your opponent gives you everything or they give you nothing. But with Charles, you kind of feel like he's a guy who always goes out there and goes for it. You know, he's not the kind of guy who you think, man, this guy's going to try to, you know, grind me into a three-round decision or he's going to go out there and try to outpoint me on the feet. Does that add anything, a little bit of excitement when you know you're not going to have to go looking for this guy? Like, chances are he's going to come after you and he's going to give you a fight. Now, that, that gives you a lot of openings, of course, to finish him, to dominate him as well but you're not going to have to go looking for this guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, yeah, and I, I believe for me, the one thing that even me and my coaches have been really, really trying to work on is the fact that um, I have had an issue with fighting down to guys' levels. Like it, like, it, like, if a guy I felt like, or, you know, most people will see him like, oh, well, he's not at Will's level. I tend to fight at their level. So to have a guy like Oliver that's going to be coming at a high level and he's going to be pushing the pace, it, that brings the best out of me. And I, I, always, I go back to one of the biggest examples of my career is uh, fighter Michael Chandler. You know, he's one of the better guys that I've ever fought in my career. And I believe that that type of guy brings the best out of me, guys that are um, really going to push the pace and come after you. And, and they're going to bring everything that they've got, and you have to be completely ready for that. And there's no room to kind of sit back and wait on something to happen and see what's going to happen and kind of coast through. That brings the best out of me. So I'm hoping and I'm excited for a, com- a fight against a guy like this and go out there and compete against a guy like this because it's going to bring the best out of me. And, and I honestly don't believe the best is my best has ever been shown. Um, I'm still working towards it. I'm still getting comfortable in this sport. So every opportunity I get to compete against a guy like this pushes me further to actually hitting that point where I've 
finally figured it all out. Yeah. How do you, you know, that's an interesting point you brought up, Will, because we hear that a lot in other sports. I hear it a lot in football, especially when teams perform to the level of their competition, when like the Patriots end up in a, you know, a 24 to 21 matchup with the Browns, you know, some weird thing like that happens where you're like, how do they not, you know, how do they not beat the Browns by 60 (laughs) points? You know what I mean? But it's a weird thing that happens. You're not the first guy to tell me that. So how, how do you get past that? Because like I said, when you, when you beat Michael Chandler, who I think Michael could come in the UFC right now and he'd be one of the top 10 guys like yourself uh very good guy marcine hell obviously we've seen what he did you know i i, I even he even most people would say he won his last fight in the ufc so yeah he definitely <laughs> did he definitely won that fight yeah so i mean how do you how do you get past that because you know if you're fighting uh you know let's say an eddie alvarez or, or another guy in the top five you know i think we'd be expecting you know, this is gonna be an amazing fight but how do you how do you get your mindset right or whatever it is that you you, you don't have that happen because you're not alone in that there's a lot of people who do that yeah, I think it's I think it's one of those things where you have to understand that you don't control everything. You know, you can only control what you can control. So for me, that was that's my main focus now. You know, I'm I'm one of those guys that I want to control everything. I want to make everything perfect. I want to make it look like like it's the easiest thing in the world. So sometimes when you do that, you get comfortable with the idea that like, okay, well, this guy isn't really at my level, and I'm not speaking on. Oliveira, I'm just, I'm this, I'm just saying a blanket, like a, a, a blank statement. You know, this is what I think most guys are thinking, right? So for for most guys, I, what I believe is what they're thinking is, all right, I should beat this guy, hands down, easy, no worries. So we we instantly start to think that, all right, all right so I don't have to bring my hundred percent. I should, this guy's, he's fifty percent of what my hundred is. So I only need to bring like maybe like 60 or 70% of what my actual abilities are. But we don't realize that like that, that, that other 10 or 20%, that's a short range between, you know, like between that guy getting the best of you and you getting the best of that guy. So it kind of puts you in that mindset where you're kind of like hanging back too long. And all of a sudden you're down, you're down like a round or maybe down two rounds to a guy that you should have been knocked out or something. <laughs> and now you got to come back and try to get the win by knocking him out or tapping him or something. So it's just one of those things where you have to keep that mindset that, you know what, I'm not going to look at this guy's skill level. I'm going to control what I, I can control. And that's coming out here and being the best that I could possibly be this entire fight, you know, not kind of hanging out, looking around, waiting doing a little gym spa or whatever you got to be at the top all the time because your next fight it might be that guy that you're like oh man i gotta get going for this guy you know what i mean like it may so you you have to keep yourself in that mindset where i'm going to go out here and i'm going to hurt and neutralize anybody at any level at any point bottom line that's period it you know yeah, I think that's a, the biggest thing is realizing that something isn't necessarily right and fixing it, you know, kind of acknowledging that because I'm quite sure there's a million other guys out there and girls who would probably say things like, uh, oh, you know, I, you know, I didn't have the best training sessions or, you know, I, you know, I was going in there a little injured, like realizing that, yeah, maybe, maybe I'm looking at this guy and thinking I'm so much better than him that I should blow yeah. him out of the water. You know what I mean? I think that acknowledging what yeah. you're doing and fixing it, that's a big deal. You know what I mean? I think, I think that's a, a, a brave thing to say because you, you know how this sport is. There's a lot of fighters probably wouldn't be, you know, smart enough to say that. Let's just be honest. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me. And I think a lot of guys are nervous about saying that. They think, like, it, I, I don't know. I, for me, I know for a long time, I was nervous to say that yeah. I think I'm fighting down to guys' levels, you know. And I was, and I think it's because it makes you sound, it may sound a little arrogant. It may sound a little like like you're boasting or something like you're, but it's a it's the honest truth, and some of these guys who who don't want to say it should be able to say it. Now. And you watch it, you see in some of these fights, you we can see as fans, and I'm a fan of the sport. You can see when some guys be like that guy is way better than that guy, but that guy is making him look bad. For example, um, and, and I'm not trying to speak bad on him, but the Rashid, Rashad Evans and uh, Daniel Kelly fight. Um, Rashad is way better than Daniel Kelly, but Daniel Kelly showed up and never gave up. He was, he didn't fight at like, he didn't have that mindset. Well, you're way better than me. You're supposed to win this fight. He went out there and was like, I'm going to control what I can control. And I'm just going to put it out here and try to get this win. But you could kind of see that Rashad was kind of hanging back. 
kind of had the attitude like, oh, yeah, I'm, I could beat this guy at any point. I can knock him out at any point. And then now we go to the judges. He ends up losing that fight. And now we're all like, well, what the heck was that? You know, so we all can run into that. So now it's one of those things. Well, how do we regroup? We have to regroup by saying, you know what? I'm going to be Daniel Kelly now. And all I'm going to do is control what I can control and go out there and just f- compete and fight until that last bell, and I don't care what your skill level is, I don't know what you do, but this is what I'm going to do, and then you end up coming out with better results. Yeah, so with that being said, a lot of people looking at this fight would say, well, Will Brooks, in my opinion, is a top 10 level lightweight. I think most people would say that about you. Charles Oliveira's coming up from featherweight. He's maybe not a real lightweight, those kind of things. He's coming off a couple of losses. Ah, this is, you know, Will's a pretty you know sizable favorite in this one. So, you know, going into this one, do you have that mindset of, you know, if you go out there and perform to your best, this probably shouldn't be a close fight, but you have to go out there and perform to your best, right? Yeah, man, I mean, it... it it's hard to do that too because you still have to look. I'm still looking at a guy that is, has had a great run. He had a great run at, uh, at featherweight. Um, I believe, like you said, he was at lightweight previous to that, right? Yeah. Absolutely. So he's had he's had spurts where he's been he's put on display that he has the ability to be a, a contender. You know, or somebody who could be in the top five in the featherweight. We could be in the top five of the lightweight if he you know made a uh, transition um, to lightweight, you know, he's a, he has the skill sets, right? And and this is me speaking as a fan of the sport, you know, not as a fighter right now, because as a fighter, as a competitor, I don't believe he has the skills to be in that cage with me. But if I'm speaking as a fan, you know, I, I see his skills and I see what he he's capable of, you know? So I guess going into this training camp, getting ready to fight a guy like this, I'm kind of leaning more towards the fan aspect of it more than the fighter aspect of it because I want that feeling of knowing that, damn, this dude is a threat at featherweight or lightweight or wherever he goes. He could be a problem for anyone, you know? So that's where my mindset is. So going into this fight, I'm not thinking, oh, yeah, he's a featherweight, he's smaller, I'm going to go out here and and walk all over him. No, I'm looking at a guy who just has incredible skill, uh, an incredible skill set and is willing to go out there and try to take your head off at any t- at any point of this fight, so that's what I, that's how I'm approaching. Yeah. On the flip side, though, if the best Will Brooks we've seen shows up on that cage on April eighth at Buffalo, this should be a, a dominant fight for you, though, right? If, if that's the way we're looking, yeah, you're on your best. This this, this is going to be easy. Like you, the best Will Brooks beats anybody. I genuinely believe that. I don't say that to try to boast or 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 promote myself or anything like that. I just genuinely believe throughout my career, throughout my life of competing. Whenever the best Ill Will Brooks shows up and he's worked hard and he's just gotten it done and he put the time in the gym and he's locked in focus, I've beat everybody. I've been everything that I'm capable of being, and I've that that's what's going to happen. If I go out there and I'm focused and I'm locked in with my mind, my body, and my coaches, and the game plan is locked in, this would be an easy fight, regardless of what Oliver brings to the table. Yeah, I love it. Well, I love this matchup. I love the card, obviously, fighting in Buffalo, I'm sure, getting back on pay-per-view. And uh, as I always say, man, I appreciate you taking the time, Will. I'm really looking forward to this one. I'm sure if I'm excited, I know you're excited. So I appreciate the time today, man. Safe training the rest of the way. Safe travels up to Buffalo. And I look forward to seeing you up there in a couple weeks. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Have a good day. Have a good weekend. Have a good weekend. You too. Talk to you soon, buddy. All right, man. Take care. A big thank you, of course, to Ill Will Brooks for being on the show. Make sure you check him out on Saturday night as he takes on Charles Oliveira. I was about to say Alex Oliveira. That was his last opponent. Charles Oliveira. And uh, with that said, that's the show this time. Now, we will be back with another show later this week. We got a uh, we got another three deep show as we talk to UFC light heavyweight champion Daniel Cormier. We're going to talk to UFC 210 welterweight competitor Patrick the Predator Cote. And we're also going to talk to UFC legend, UFC Hall of Famer, Boss El Huapo Root. So make sure you stay tuned for that as well. So... For today, I want to say a big thank you, of course, to all of our guests, Gegard Musasi, Mackenzie Dern, and Will Brooks. Appreciate all of them coming on the show. And uh, we will see you guys for a second show later this week as we welcome into the show Daniel Cormier, Patrick Cote, and, of course, Boss Root. So stay tuned for that. Big thank you to everyone tuning in to the Fight Society Podcast. Make sure you check us out on iTunes and SoundCloud. Follow me on Twitter at Damon Martin. And we will see you later this week with another show preview on UFC 210.